Every day, at least 22 U.S. veterans commit suicide. But a new program could save their lives. It's called Save a Warrior. This isn't broken. This is broken. He's told me multiple times that if this program doesn't work, he's going to kill himself. Hi. How are you? Getting into these, these seats is always hard in a dress and yes. heels. Like hence, hence the pants. <laughs> but uh, thank you guys for being here. And this documentary is so, is so poignant and so relevant because this is what we're dealing with today. And there's a reason American Sniper was such a high grossing movie because it really dealt with the reintroduction or lack of reintroduction, I think is a better term, of veterans into society and the impact that has on them. So let me start by asking you, how did you first become interested in this topic? You know, I, I met the guy you saw in the clip uh, who was standing in front of the sort of classroom of veterans. Um, his name is Jake and I met him over breakfast and he said, you know, we're running these programs called Save a Warrior and if you'd like to come and visit our, one of our cohorts in California, we'd love to have you. So I hopped on a plane, I went out to see it, and when I landed, they were in the middle of their project. It's about a five and a half day program. And um, I sat down at a, at a um, picnic table with some guys as they were having uh, lunch, and I said, so how's it going? And three of the guys, all service members, uh, on average had been in the service for about nine years. One guy had, um, had actually been a police officer in, during 9-11 and then signed up afterwards. Three of them burst into tears and started crying and telling me about their experience. And I knew that something was happening here and that I wanted to come back for another cohort and actually embed myself with some people who were going through and see if we could tell the real story of what was happening there. What, and if it did it work or did it not work. Um, we made it very clear that if we needed access and also we would follow the stories wherever they led us. So we found two young men who were going through cohort 10 and we started days before they left and really embedded with them, meaning hung out at their homes, slept on their couches, our photographers stayed with them 24 seven. And then they went off for five and a half days and then we came back with them to their homes to really see what kinds of things were they doing? What were they being taught? What were they experimenting with? What was working and what kinds of things were not working? You had one guy named Delon who's a, a was a big drinker, and you can see him while we're camped out at his house before he goes off to this program, literally downing bottles and bottles of wine every single night, uh, completely drunk as he stumbles his way around the house, pushing his kids out of the way. And then Garrett, who is struggling with just tremendous anger. He's sort of seething all the time. At one point, he was taking the garbage out and you could see him trying to like collapse the boxes and then all of a sudden like slam the boxes into the garbage receptacle because he's just furious constantly. And both of them were trying to figure out, how do I get my life back? How do I come back from war and, and, and regain life with my family that I had before I left? Both of them very much. I mean, you saw Delon's wife crying saying, you know, he has said he's going to kill himself if he doesn't, if this program doesn't work. He'd been very clear with his family. This was it. He was, you know, he, he couldn't take it anymore. Garrett was a little um, more reticent about being overt with his suicidal thoughts, but he was struggling with the same things. We wanted to see what is it really like to be on the verge of suicide and to feel like you have one last opportunity to save your life. Unless you guys think that this is an ephemeral issue that doesn't really impact any of us. I went to a military high school and I just found out that one of my classmates that I graduated with committed suicide from PTSD because he enlisted after graduation thinking that we'd never go to war and lo and behold we did go to war and that's it. The stats are pretty remarkable. I mean if you think 22 soldiers every day commit suicide and in a way, it's not a real number because it doesn't count people who die by, you know, suicide by cop, they call it. It doesn't count people who um, become addicted and sort of kill themselves through drugs and alcohol. So I'm not sure how real that number is. I think it's actually probably a little bit higher. And that statistic is generally older uh, veterans. It's not the young guys who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. It's Vietnam era veterans who are killing themselves at that rate. So we really wanted to explore a story that I think 
in some ways is told a lot in the media, but, it, but not told authentically. You know, very rarely do you get to sort of see it unfold their own story and, and what they're going to do about it. And that's what we wanted to explore. And as we were saying backstage, these guys are thoroughly prepped for going to war. I mean, basic training, all the exercises, the brotherhood. However, they are never actually told that they will be killing people. That it's, it's all very much, you're going to eliminate the target. You're going to focus on yeah, the there enemy. There are euphemisms. There are euphemisms because allow it's very you uncomfortable. To, to do your job. Yes. And then I think coming back as well, I think the process of going off to war is a very different process than the process of coming back. The, the folks we interviewed talked about the re-entry system as very much like an online course that you sort of had to click through. And if you needed help, you should go and you know ask someone for help. And they didn't feel that they were given even a, a small percentage of the training that went into preparing to go off to war uh, when they came back. And the spouses aren't prepared either. Yeah, no, I think it's, it was interesting to see just how challenging it was um, for the spouses, certainly for Delon's wife. I mean, she has two children, she was in school full time, and dealing with a, a full-blown alcoholic who she had to constantly sort of be the buffer in her family to protect her children. Delon told me very clearly, he said, you know, I started getting afraid when I would have these dreams where I was taking a hammer and smashing it into my daughter's head. And it scared me, and I, I, I didn't want, I didn't want to do that, and I wanted to stop dreaming about it, and I didn't, I don't know what to do to help myself, and so he thought this five and a half day course might be the last resort. Now, why do you think this issue is so underexplored? Is it because we're just uncomfortable talking about it? I think mental health, as a rule, is something we don't really talk about very well. I think it, it requires. It requires sitting in the story. I mean, we had to camp out and really literally live with the guys. It, it, you can't run in and tell a quick story around mental health. It's challenging. I think there's a tremendous stigma. Yeah, I, you know, uh, uh, Garrett, who we interviewed, talked about, you know, the first time he started sharing that he was having some issues. And he immediately felt the repercussions. And he didn't, he thought it was hurting his career to be honest about uh, what he was struggling with. So, you know, if you do that, I think you're, you're, you're going to set up a stigma where people don't necessarily want to get treatment because they want to get better, but they don't necessarily want to jeopardize their career or worry, uh, you know, make people worry about what they might do. You know, <laughs> PTS, uh, I think a lot of the coverage in the media is, you know, there's a guy and he kills his family, right? And, oh, you know, the PTS. And, and it just we don't do a very good job in really exploring the issue and explaining to people all the range of, of what post-traumatic stress can be, how it can be managed, what things can't be managed, and talk to people who are regular folks who are dealing with it. If you could solve this issue in veterans, you certainly could help solve it in the general population as well. How does Save a Warrior work? I know it's, it's a five-day program. Yeah, and so they do a lot of, um, what I thought was interesting is they do a lot of coursework that's similar in a number of different programs, right? So there's transcendental meditation. There's a lot of data that shows that that is actually a very effective. Delon loved transcendental meditation. Garrett did it once and was like, mm, this is not going to work for me. Continued to do it. But it never stuck. Um, there's equine therapy. They do a ropes course. There's just lots of sort of uh, classes and sessions and talking about and dealing with and creating a brotherhood for people who very much would tell me that they felt very separated from the brotherhood that the military worked so hard to create, right? This sense of, I would give my life for this person who is my brother in the field. You come back home and you have none of that anymore. Plus, you've had experiences that your average neighbor, friend, spouse, sibling... Doesn't understand. I, I can't possibly understand. And so you've sort of lost a lot of that support, and I think that adds to a lot of the challenges that veterans face. But this is still a private endeavor, correct? Well, Save a Warrior is. They that raise means you every have to, dime, You so. have to seek it out. Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is um, veterans are very selfless. And, and, and Jake was actually telling me this, Jake Clark, who runs the organization, he was saying, you know, every single person they give a slot to, and it's very hard to get a slot. There are only about 11 slots. They're free for the veteran. They have to raise about $1,600 for each person. And every single person would say, listen, I, I think I have a friend who probably needs this more, so you should give it to somebody else. He said, without fail, it happened every single time. And, you know, you almost had to force people to say, no, this slot is yours. I will see you. <laughs> say, I am picking you up at the airport. You need to be there. Because I think there is a sense of, 
help, let me help this person instead of helping myself, when really, when it comes to post-traumatic stress, you have to help yourself. Do you think there's any sense that this will ever become national policy or any, anything similar like this will be I, instituted? All of these things are things that are being explored, equine therapy, transcendental meditation, all being explored, and they're used across a number of different programs. So I think there is a real sense of what is working and what is not working. Where do we see uh, effectiveness and where do we don't? And there's a number of people now trying to solve this issue. So. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's going to be national policy as opposed to just everyone recognizes the things that are effective for post-traumatic stress. We're at a, we're at a critical point. Uh, Garrett, who's one of the young men featured in our doc, you know, when I saw him last, he told me uh, yet another friend of his had died. So he's up to about nine or ten people from his battalion who've died. I mean, that's an insane. Imagine knowing ten people who've committed suicide. That's insane. And by national policy, I mean accessible to all veterans, as opposed to people who know people who know people who watch the program, who, then who get follow you into the, link, the program because you, know, you made blah, a call. Yeah, yeah I, you know, again, I, I think what I, I know there's a lot of people trying to solve the problem, and yeah, it is a question of cost. It'd be great if it actually was. It can't just be one program that takes ten people every single cohort. It has to be massive. Yeah, I think you need to see efficacy, right? You need to see what is the thing that works. What is the thing that actually saves lives? Um, Jake Clark's theory is that it's the soldiers themselves who are going to work to save their own brothers, that they're going to have to be responsible for each other, that people can't just come back and enter a system where they're not connected anymore, uh, having been in a system where your entire existence and your entire survival is about that connection. Uh, it's really problematic. So when you went back to these guys' houses after they had completed the, the course, what differences did you notice? So um, we went back with Dillon, and he, um, he wakes up his wife and, and eventually kicks us out of his bedroom because we're following him with cameras. <laughs> he's like, and y'all need to go. I haven't seen my wife in five days. But he's stopped drinking immediately when he gets there. There's no place to get alcohol. And the next morning, he starts pouring all the bottles of alcohol that are hidden all over you know, the house and the kitchen, pours it down the sink. And to see the change in him, I mean, I, I can't wait for you guys to see this documentary because the change is so dramatic. And again, we went in with, we are going to shoot whatever happens. Whatever happens. So if they came back exactly the same, that's what it would Absolutely. Be. There were absolutely no ground rules in what we could do. We were going to shoot everything. And the men knew that. They, they actually were so far gone in a way that they didn't care. I think they just didn't, I don't think he cared. I think he thought, listen, if this doesn't work, I'm going to kill myself. So you want to shoot that? Go ahead. I don't care. Yeah, and I think his wife, I mean, from watching it, was so desperate that if you had told her that swallowing bleach was going to cure everything, she would have done that. Absolutely. You know? For Garrett, it was interesting to see him come back. A lot of what he was struggling with was, well, what am I now? He went into the military to be a photographer. And so he now we, we now work with him. He's one of our photographers around the programs and the stories that we do around veterans because he's wildly talented. But, you know, the way to become a photographer is to, to do it. You have to go work at your craft. And so it's been, I've kept in touch with both of them and it's been really wonderful to see how well they're doing. And you know, the statistics that they have around Save a Warrior, highly anecdotal, we only focused on one cohort, cohort 10, uh, but their numbers are really terrific, but it's very tiny. I think it's great that you're spotlighting this because I know John Stewart, uh, when he was at The Daily Show, and I think that this still continues, made an effort to reach out to veterans and hire them for physicians because he said that they're immensely qualified for a lot of the work that's done in TV, you know, the speed, the response time, the fact that they're yeah. self-starters, et cetera, Tons et cetera. Of translatable but, skills. But why do you think that this issue of veterans and reintegration is something that just No one's is, figured it out yet. I think people wanted to do two things. One, I think that there is a massive civilian military divide. Or I think there's a lot of people who just don't even know anybody in the military. That's very different than the way the United States was, you know, in the 1940s and the 1950s. So I think that's a, a big shift. And I also think no one solved, you know, the, no one solved the problem yet. Garrett told me a very funny story, um, which he he said, you know, when I when I came back um, for more, I started like had to make a resume, and so he had a resume that had on it weapons ex um, expert and explosives expert. And this is what he was going to send to the HR department at like a major company. And he's like, I look back now and recognize that was probably not a really good, good thing. Good hiring tactic, yeah. But, but he, you know, clearly 
had no idea, and he couldn't quite figure out how do you translate those, how do you translate weapons expert into what that means if you want to be a photojournalist? What what is that? What are the translatable skills? Somebody needs to be there to help that transition. And again, I think the media does a poor job. Every story story we tell is over the top, larger than life, you know, crazy, insane, and we don't tell the the the, the daily struggle, the heroic daily average person struggle of what is it like to come back and try to figure out where you fit in and what skills you have that are translatable to a life and a job. You're absolutely right because we either cover the shootouts, the tragedies, or the celebrity telethons slash concerts to raise money. But we don't, I mean, I personally don't know what happens when a soldier gets off a plane and gets in his spouse's car and is driven back home. What's next? Yeah, and it's, it really depends. I think part of the problem is, well, it depends. It depends what they know. It depends who they've connected with. It depends on what their rank was and how much money do they have and how much access do they have to information. For some people, nothing happens. They come back and they're a mess. And for others, there's actually a really great network. So I, I think that is you know, just a huge challenge in trying to figure out how can you create a system that really is helpful for the veterans coming back in who need some help. And then, of course, you know, female veterans, they run cohorts for women as well, separate from the men, obviously, which is a, a different set of needs. We, the, the documentary that we have runs, and then afterwards there's a conversation with some advocacy groups like IAVA and Team Rubicon, the National Association of Black Veterans, the Bush Institute, um, doctors who work in post-traumatic stress, um, caregivers, the Dole Foundation that focuses on caregiving, really trying to answer that question we, as civilians, often will say, hey, thanks for your service. Oh, you're getting on a plane, clap, clap, clap. But, but how, are we, how are we actually helpful? What can we actually do? I think that's the question that we need to ask. If we really are saying thank you for your service, then we should put something behind that. Now, you've covered Hurricane Katrina. You've covered the tsunami. Why does this specific topic resonate so much with you? You know, when I started a production company, we said as our mission that we would cover stories that were untold and undertold. And some of those stories, we did a documentary looking at women who were rescue workers at 9-11 because they had said to me that they thought they were written out of the narrative. And I was like, oh, I don't think so. And then you went back to see and you're like, actually, there are no women who are rescuers. They are rescued. And I thought, oh, this is a story that really has been left out of sort of the public record. I think the same thing for veterans, sadly, because there are so many, and we claim as Americans to love and support them, but the untold story is how do you come back and authentically tell the story of someone who's trying to reintegrate, someone who's struggling with post-traumatic stress? How do you change this sense of stigma around this issue uh, which is obviously taking the lives of so many people. So I think our focus is in untold stories, whether that's about race. We did a big series around black in America, around ethnicity, and Latino in America, around religion. We did Muslim in America, gay in America. And really just what is the, what is the story that we don't know? What is the untold version that is really our mission as a company, Starfish Media, to elevate that story? And how did you convince these guys to give you such access? Because, dear God, some of those scenes are so uncomfortable to watch. Yeah, you know, I think um, two things happened. One, they knew we knew we needed access. And for every doc we shoot, we just need access. And if someone can't give us access, we just don't do it. But it's one thing just to know in theory, and another thing to we allow make... someone to witness your marital fights. I think and once you stay with people around the clock, they get used to you. So, I, I, I mean, truly, they have to say... I will give you full access, and then you just start shooting them, and you never and you never don't shoot. Um, I think for these guys, they were particularly desperate, and so I, I truly think most just didn't care. You know, to, in order to be embarrassed or ashamed or worried about how you're turning out on TV, you actually have to care about living. And for a lot of these guys who are in this tenth cohort, they didn't care. You know, this, they were this close to just being done with life. And most of them, many of them, I should say, um, had attempted suicide. You know, they had tried to kill themselves. So they really, I mean, Jake describes it as the lo their last house on the block. Like, this is it. So there's no one there who's concerned about, well, you know, this story might make me look bad. I don't know how, you know, Garrett said to me, I think the media sucks. I think you guys get it wrong all the time. So I'm going to do this to see if you could do this and not screw it up.
I was like, oh, that's charming. Thanks. Thanks for the vote of con Thanks, Garrett, for the vote of confidence. But I think what it does put pressure on you to make sure that you're always turning the story back to them and having them tell their own story about their own experience. And my job as a journalist is to, you know, push, 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 always pushing to try to make sure we're getting, you know, the real truth from them and not just the first version of the story that they're telling us. And what surprised you the most about this experience? You know, I think the degree to which people want to be better. You know, they'd all tell me that they wanted to kill themselves, and then you'd realize they don't. They want to live. They just want to live in a way that that's a life that's not killing them. Garrett describes wanting to commit suicide as, you know, you're standing in this burning building, and you don't want to jump. You want to live, but the, the building's burning, and you just you just... The only relief you have is if you just jump. And he sort of, sort of saw it that way. He, he doesn't want to jump. He just needs a solution. And he needs, he needs help to figure out, OK, how do we make the building stop burning so that you don't have to choose between burning and jumping, that you can actually just stay in the building and live in the building and thrive in the building with your family. And I think the quote, I actually wrote it down, was, I don't want to burn anymore, yeah, which I was like, God, can you imagine waking up every day feeling like your insides are on fire? Yeah, it's... Like how it's horrible that would be? So awful. And to see someone come back, I mean, the interesting thing to see in Garrett, he struggled for a couple of days when he just went, you know, stopped drinking cold turkey. And really, he was, you know, it was hard for him. But to see him taking his daughter to gymnastics, which he had never done in her entire life, like interacting with his family um, was fascinating. And seeing his wife struggle with it, right? Because she hasn't been given a support. She hasn't been given the five and a half day program. She, she feels like, oh, I, now I have another change of, you know, to deal with someone who's got post-traumatic stress is this constant... She, you know, people have called it like you're carrying someone on a potato chip, just trying to make sure that you're navigating. And so for her, once again, her world was just upended um, in ways that I think eventually will be great for their family, but it was definitely a struggle for her as well. And now let's turn it over to our audience. I'm sure you guys have some questions for this fabulous lady. Hi, um, I wanted to ask you, after producing this doc, um, how would you approach lawmakers to um, be more aware of mental health awareness? Like, how would you talk to them and tell them about veterans? You know, I think one of the things that I've liked about being a documentarian is that I don't have to talk to them. I can just sort of use the film to tell the story and, and why it's really critical to let people tell their own story. This is not my version of their life. Like, this is their story. My job is just to sit there and push and push and call BS when I think people are lying to me and to you know, challenge people when I think they're not delivering everything that they could give to me. But it's really their words. And I think if you can use any documentary to create something powerful, you, know, you have a great opportunity because it becomes part of this conversation of like, okay, how do we, how do we make change? Change will never be. Soledad you know, reached out to a lawmaker. It doesn't work like that. It needs to be people are moved and they understand a problem. And then when the people are moved, the lawmakers say, oh crap, we actually have to do something about this because now people care about this issue. We need to figure it out. Hi, Ms. O'Brien. Um, I just want to thank you for, before I ask my question, I want to honor you and thank you for... Go right ahead. Take your time. Are you thanking and honoring? You take as much time as you need, honey. All right, I will. <laughs> um, well, I just want to thank you for taking the time out to really dig deeper and bring truth forward, especially with the generation we have now. Um, I have a personal experience with that from my uncle, and I got to see him leave, and I got to see him come back. And you know, they're very close. They don't have much to say, and it's just a very different thing. So. I'm grateful with much prayer and just God that he's now found his way back in the society. You know, he's back in school and doing so much. So I thank you for that. And I honor you for bringing this forward because it's something that does need to be um, dealt with. And, and, I, and I know that as time increases that they will give more back to the veterans. So my question is, how do you put aside your emotionalism? Like with dealing with all of their emotions and their family as a woman, how do you put that aside and stay focused on your vision? I never thought that the goal was to, to not be emotional. Whether I was reporting on Hurricane Katrina or in Haiti after an earthquake or after a tsunami, I, I actually think the strength is to be emotional, to be a human being, to, right? to ask the questions that a human being would ask, to cry with someone if something horrible has happened to them, right? I mean, like, I'm a human being, and I think that's a strength. I think people who 
who pretend like they're not seeing you as a human being and they're doing an interview are not doing you a service. So I have no shame at all in bawling with moms who've, you know, lost their husbands in 9-11. You, I have no problem at all in, you know, in sitting down and falling apart in the middle of a tragedy if that's what I'm feeling. You know, I'm okay with that. I think I'm human. And I think people want to talk to people and share their stories with people who they trust and who they think are human and who they think are listening and want to get it right, right? I want to understand and make sure I'm telling their story right. And I accept the challenge of don't screw it up. So, you know, I, I know we like to pretend like, oh, well, try not to have any emotion, but I actually think that's just a, a mistake. I would disagree with that. I agree with you. I think some of the most memorable moments in recent media coverage of major world events are when anchors or reporters actually break down and have that moment when, you, when they're like, oh, my God. Like, I'm actually witnessing something horrific. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with you. Um, last question, please. Hi, Soledad. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, how has the late Morley Safer impacted your career as a journalist? You know, it's so interesting. You know what I have just loved about 60 Minutes as a whole? What they've done is said, if you build it with quality, people will come. Right? That, that, as much as people want to say, listen, millennials today, they want shorter, tighter, it's got to be buzzy. There was a point, I'm sure you've been, you know, don't, only use sticks. No, wait, wait, nothing should be on sticks. Fast cuts, swish pans, don't ever focus on anything. You know, make sure every screen, everything has to be split screen. Every screen. Eight seconds or less, sound bites. Eight, imagine, eight second or less sound bite. I mean, all of these things are dictates that have at some point come down from a high, right? Like, this is the new rule that we've decided. And what 60 Minutes has done, Morley Safer included, has just marched along doing damn good work, right? Like what they've done is done great reporting at a very high level, really, really smart and thoughtful, and they win, right? So to me, I just hold them in such tremendous esteem because I think you say it's never about the swish pan and the eight second sound bite and the double box, big box, little box, box within a box. It's always about what is the story? What is the quality of the storytelling? Is this well done? People go back to things that are well done, period. Amen. <laughs> and when can we see this? So we have a one day airing only in theaters around the country, Tuesday, May 24th, so this upcoming Tuesday. I'll be in Union Square, which is not very far from here, watching our film on the big screen. Uh, and, um, and that'll be the one day. If you want to buy a ticket, you can go to fathomevents.com. The event is the conversation after the documentary that airs. And then afterwards? You know, one of the things that I have really enjoyed about running my own production company, which we've done now for about two and a half years, so I'm a relatively new CEO, is we own all our content. And so I don't know. We have opportunities. Whenever you decide. Absolutely. As the boss lady. Well, I, but the goal is to make sure that as many people as possible can see this content. It's a beautifully shot film. Um, we work with Media Storm as a partner on it. They're phenomenal. It's a, it's a gorgeous film, and I just want as many people as possible to see it as they should. Thank you so much for My being pleasure. here. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you.